Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, President of our Energy Policy, and welcome to our webinar today on competition and choice in electricity markets, critically important issue facing us as we move forward. And we're very fortunate to have a terrific panel to discuss this issue. Uh, I'm very grateful to our partners for supporting uh, our energy policy webinars. Thank you to all of you in the audience for um, joining us uh, on our um, regular webinar series. Uh, but thanks to our partners and particularly today to our co-host, uh, the Electric Power Supply Association. Uh, and we'll be getting to Todd Snitchler, the CEO of that in just a second. Um, I do wanna remind all of you that we will take questions from, from you at the end of, toward the end of the discussion. Uh, there is a tab on your dashboard on the right that allows you to type in questions and we will get to as many as we possibly can uh, as we get to the end of the hour. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have um, one of the nation's experts on this issue uh, to kick things off with opening remarks. And Todd Snitchler is not only um, the president and CEO of EPSA, the Electric Power Supply Association, but also a former uh, vice president for market development at API and had, before joining API, a distinguished career in government as the chair of the Ohio Public Utilities Commission and as an elected official as a member of the General Assembly of the state of Ohio. So uh, we are extremely pleased to have Todd um, introduce this subject with some opening remarks, and he will then introduce our panel. Todd? Thanks, Bill. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and with all of you that are uh, on the webinar and to the entire Our Energy Policy team for the invitation to offer a few opening comments. So before we hear from some very smart people who are going to talk about some very challenging issues, if you'll allow me, I'd like to do a little level setting. From our perspective, competitive power markets have worked, markets can continue to work, and they have delivered and can continue to deliver on several critical areas when it comes to America's energy future. Those areas are reliability, affordability, and emissions reductions. That success has occurred simultaneously, however, with some monumental changes in the energy value chain. The shale revolution and low-price natural gas, rapidly falling costs of renewable energy, deployment and development of innovative technologies like battery storage, record low wholesale power prices, shifting state policy goals and ambitions, state and federal subsidies to preferred resources, and states that are flexing their policy muscles in the markets and, as, and every other level of government, frankly. At EPSA, we believe that an optimal energy transition and America's energy future must ensure reliability and should also be built on principles of competition. Calls to limit competition or abandon RTOs or revert to a more monopoly-driven approach put us on a backward-looking path, and we can't afford that if we're interested in continued progress. As the saying goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. We can likely all agree that the energy system is under tremendous pressure to change and adapt, and to do so, frankly, in a much quicker fashion than it has in the past. There are a lot of policy choices under consideration at all levels of government, but that list really needs to focus on reliability, affordability, and emissions reductions. First, we believe reliability is paramount. Consumers of all types expect it, and market participants endeavor to deliver it as near to perfectly as they can. Regulators at all levels can't afford to lose sight of its critical importance or assume it away in their decision-making. At a time of competing policy goals, reliability must remain front and center, not talked around or taken for granted. And recently, in some quarters, I've heard people saying that reliability is the last refuge of scoundrels, and I disagree. I think reliability is job number one, and ensuring it must remain a top priority. In short, NERC has been raising concerns around reliability for some time. Recent experience has also clearly revealed where those concerns were exposing to the bright light of day the reality-based operational challenges in both California and Texas, to name a couple of places. And it's not rhetoric when reliability issues are happening in real time. Second, affordability is crucial for delivering the results policymakers say that they want. Polling shows that consumers are more willing to support changes to the power supply as long as it doesn't significantly impact their wallets. Further, 
Businesses are committed to certain ESG targets and affordable power makes meeting those goals more achievable and at a lower cost to consumers who will ultimately pay those bills. The use of competitive forces to keep costs down enables a longer runway for development of new resources of all kinds and improves levels of public support. Something that often seems like common sense, but many are unwilling to say, is that if we allow costs to get out of proportion to people's willingness and ability, ability to pay, that misalignment will be profoundly detrimental to achieving those policy goals that are both being passed and debated today. Markets have historically presented a foundation to allow new and cleaner technologies and resources to enter while allowing least cost solutions to win out while also incentivizing efficiency that leads to lower costs and reduced emissions. Policymakers and stakeholders all spend a lot of time arguing about policies and market rules, but in the end, it's the customers who end up paying the costs associated with those policy choices and rules. Third, emissions reductions and supporting lower emitting resources are the central policy goals being debated and implemented at the state and federal level. This issue is closely tied to questions around reliability and affordability. But how do we achieve emissions reductions while preserving reliability and keeping power affordable to all customers? To be sure, you're gonna hear some observations today that will hopefully be part of that discussion and will also advance reality-based policy choices, understand the implications of those choices, and frankly, how all stakeholders can collectively work to address them to assure grid reliability, as well as the other benefits of affordability and emissions reductions. With that, I'm gonna step aside and let Devin Hartman from the R Street Institute take it from here. Devin is the Director of Energy and Environmental Policy at the R Street Institute, where he leads a team that brings a pragmatic and analytically sound pro-market perspective to energy and environmental policy. And prior to that, Devin served as the President and CEO of the Electricity Consumers Resource Council, or ELCON. With that, Devin, take it away. Thank you for the warm introduction, Todd. And we're really excited about today's uh, panel discussion. And as Todd alluded to, um, there's arguably a, a more important impetus to have this discussion now than at any point in decades. Um, we've seen a lot of progress, but we've also seen some areas of regression on the policy front uh, in the march towards more uh, competitive uh, electricity markets. And so to bring in um, some great perspectives here from both the scholar community as well as the practitioner community, uh, we have three panelists that are, are going to uh, provide some fantastic insights for all of you today. First off, we have Amanda Frazier. Amanda is the Senior Vice President of Regulatory Policy at Vistra Corporation where she is responsible for representing the company's interest in the organized power markets and before state and federal agencies. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks. Next up, we have Dr. Lynn Kiesling. Lynn is a research professor in the College of Engineering, Design, and Computing at the University of Colorado in Denver, where her research focuses on grid modernization and energy economics to examine regulation, market design, and technology in the development of retail markets. Welcome, Lynn. Thanks, and Devin. Last, but certainly not least, uh, is Pat Wood. Pat Wood is the CEO of Hunt Energy Network, where he focuses on new power storage infrastructure and distributed assets across the power grid. Prior to that, Pat was chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and at the Public Utility Commission of Texas. Welcome, Pat. Howdy, Devin. Howdy, y'all. All right, so to, to kick things off, I'm going to, I'm going to ask um, Pat to actually answer our first question on really putting competitive markets and their evolution into, into context uh, today. And we certainly have to learn a lot from the past if we're going to understand where we can and should be going in the future. So Pat, since the 1990s, roughly two thirds of the nation joined competitive wholesale electricity markets. Some states went further to disband monopolies and adopted competitive generation in retail supply. Do you see the pace of this trend continuing going forward? Well, I think, uh, as I've said before, liberty is inevitable. Uh, of course, watching Ukraine, it's, it's sometimes as a sideways dodge, but uh, you know, what, what this has been is a liberalization of the uh, monopoly industry that you know did a great job in the 20th century, but in the in the 70s with the passage of PURPA, we really came to the general consensus that generation was not a natural monopoly. 
if it ever was, it certainly isn't anymore. And so uh, the federal agency in charge FERC, uh, both in natural gas and in electricity, moved forward to really separate out those competitive parts of what used to be considered a bundled monopoly into um, a regulated part, which is the wires company, in our case, in the, in the power business, the pipes over in the gas side, and then to push the marketing and the generation and the production of gas and all those into a competitive environment. It brought tremendous value uh, to the nation. I think The Economist magazine designated the natural gas deregulation effort one of the most successful economic uh, transformations in the U.S. Uh, last century. So. We built on that, uh, FERC did. We did copy that when we were down here in uh, the uh, non-FERC regulated Texas. We copied pretty much what FERC was doing with the move toward unbundling the power industry uh, to competitive and non-competitive segments, the setting up of independent system operators to really manage the regional grids and to move forward. When I came to FERC in 2000, that work was well underway um, and we really brought a lot of new parts of the country into that more competitive market structure while still respecting states' abilities to decide on that other end of the wires should that retail franchise also be uh, subject to competition and customer choice. So do I see it moving forward? I think it's been a, uh, a rough two decades since the California energy crisis, which I was kind of brought up to FERC to try to clean up. and. Um, a lot of people pushed back and questioned if that was really the right way to go. Um, I, we plowed ahead more thoughtfully uh, with more market oversight, with more constraints, recognizing that this industry really, you can't go from 100 years of full regulation to a flash cut competitive market. Um, and, and so there's been, I think, a slower progress here. The onset of renewable energy and the, just the ubiquitousness of it everywhere in all parts of the country um, has really, I think, re-energized that effort. I mean, it's the subject of our call here today. But that groundwork was laid, you know, again, back in the 70s with uh, PURPA. And I expect that uh, as it has gone in, the non, in a non-linear function uh, from then to now, it will continue as people experiment with uh, the great gift of federalism, it, it's messy, but it also has resulted in a lot of great data points that each state can look at as they help try to shape the national future together. That's a great perspective. Thanks, Pat, and thanks for going all the way back to PURPA and bringing it up to the, the current context. Um, Amanda, I want you to kind of weigh in on this uh, trend and, and where you see it going, especially as a practitioner with a heavy stake both in the competitive generation uh, and retail supply components. Uh, what do you what do you see as the the trends in this field going forward? Yeah, thanks, Devin and and Pat. I think you um, laid that out really well. I agree with you. It's nonlinear in in the progression from regulated to competitive markets. And um, and you pointed out that the growth of renewables and the interest in in uh, bringing decarbonization in particular to the electric grid ought to spur the, the development of um, more mature competitive markets. Uh, right now, the markets are not really designed for decarbonizing. They're designed for lowest cost. And so part of gro the growth of the markets will be needing to recognize how you bring the value of um, those environmental qualities into the pricing and dispatch mechanisms of the power grids. And so I think there's a lot of room for growth, but there are some growing pains. Um, and then, you know, it's also important from my company's perspective that we continue to grow the competitive retail markets because you can accomplish a lot of efficiency in the wholesale power space, but until you get competition all the way to the end consumer, um, then you're limiting the, the total value that competition can bring. Absolutely. And and maybe to dig in a little bit further on some of these trend lines, I'm going to pose the next question here to Lynn. Of course, we've seen some states really just retain the monopoly model. We've seen some states partially adopt some degrees of competition and in different forms. And so Lynn, you know, what states have, in your opinion, have, have managed the transition to competitive markets the best and why? 
Well, I I should preface my remarks by saying I don't mean this to be a uh, a sycophant or the in my role as the president of the Patwood Fan Club, but I do think Texas <laughs> is the um, I wouldn't call it best. I would say least um, you know least challenging or least you know has the the best features. Even though obviously, uh, as we we saw in the um, Winter Storm Uri last year, market design, even in a state that has done it carefully and thoughtfully and with good attention to sound economics, um, market design is a continually evolving thing that you have to pay attention to for a lot of reasons, including the ones that Amanda just laid out. And I think the the under kind of the underpinning of all of this is um, to kind of dig into the economics, the underpinning of all of this is the dramatic technological changes that we've seen since the 1970s, spurred on by reducing barriers through things like PERPA, um, through the serendipitous, in many ways, innovation of the combined cycle gas turbine, which uh, changed the underlying economics on the generation side made wholesale power markets feasible, competitive wholesale power, market, power markets feasible in ways that they hadn't been before. And then Congress passes the Energy Policy Act of 1992, the combination of PURPA and EPAC 1992, and then uh, I think FERC Order 888, and Pat can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which I think is having an anniversary of some sort today as well uh, for its being proposed or, or passed or something, that, that that combination enabled of technological and institutional change enabled com competition to come into wholesale markets. Um, and I think the, the challenge, very much the challenge has been, as Amanda alluded to, getting the competition at the retail end while we recognize that the economic characteristic of the wires, characteristics of the wires, the transmission level and distribution level, they still have the economic characteristics that I think will, will um, necessitate some forms of regulation for the foreseeable future, uh, even as we look to a future where more and more end users can self-supply. And so I think walking that balance is going to be really important, but that I think Texas has done the best job of quarantining the monopoly, right? So, so the, the way technology has evolved, the wires essentially are, are a natural monopoly sandwiched in between two co competitive or potentially competitive markets. And um, Texas has done the best job of embedding that economic evolution into their into their framework. And you know, one of the reasons we focused on that, and thank you, Lynn, you've really been articulate on that for two decades, and it wasn't a super conscious decision, but we did really want to take every step possible to make sure that the utilities, the remaining regulated wires companies, really enabled everybody else's competitive business plans. And so if they were in that market competing as well to A, serve customers or B, generate electricity, then they were not really going to have the cleanest hands in that effort. And so trying to really keep them as the foundation of the competitive, you know, customer benefiting market was was probably going to be best if we kept them completely out of those other businesses so that Quarantining, as Lynn has trademarked the term, was um, was really helpful in doing that. I'm, I'm saying that now out in the market today, where the wires companies really, you know, are eager to be our partners, and um, you know, that's that's a very big change. I remember the day after we kind of unbundled the the Houston Lighting and Power, the the uh, competitive power advocates came to me and said, "Oh my gosh, the folks at HLMP are returning our calls, and they're wanting to take us to lunch and trying to." You know, make sure that we get what we need. And I said, it worked. I said, so hold your thought, but it works for now. So it's it's continued. And um, thank you, Lynn, for pointing that out. It it um it it is foundational that you want to make sure that you don't have advantaged players in a market to really get true benefits to customers. You do have to 
uh, demonopolize as much as you can and um, go from there. And I think if if I can add to that, um, that is one of the political compromises that was enacted in the restructured states, right? The Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, Massachusetts, et cetera, um, that did go through regulatory restructuring and did unbundle and nominally have retail competition. One of the political compromises they made in that process was to retain incumbent default service for residential customers and to provision that, and I think New Jersey pioneered this and then states like Illinois have followed by uh, doing these rolling firm three-year procurement contracts. And uh, I think that has actually created an entry barrier for a lot of suppliers that um, that I think the those who enacted that political compromise didn't necessarily anticipate. And so I think the, the biggest challenge is this question of how viable is retail competition for residential customers. Yeah, thanks for really unpacking that, Lynn, a little bit further. I, I figured some of our audience would really like to, to know a few more details on, on quarantining the monopoly and how that's done and how, and how it's um, the consequences of, of not doing it well, as we've seen in some states, as, as, uh, as particularly having an effect on adverse effect on retail markets. Um, so I think all three of you really brought up this idea of evolving technology. And a lot of times we... We, we, we really want to dig into figuring out what drives technological development as well as the adoption and the most economical and reliable uh, adoption of those new uh, uh, technologies going forward. And I think we've seen an interesting um, contrast between the, the independent power producers and how they've driven some of these changes and how they've adopted some technologies as compared to how some of the monopolies have done this uh, historically and going forward. So I'd like to open up to our, our panelists just to discuss this, um, any observations you have in terms of how the various technologies from renewables to more efficient you know, thermal fleet uses have been affected by the introduction of, of competition and where you see it going forward. I think, I think one, one interesting thing that I didn't expect, Devin, when we opened up the market, Texas put in a, a renewable portfolio standard that that was part of the political compromise to move to competitive markets. And it you know targeted adding 2000 megawatts of renewable energy to the grid by 2009. And of course, we're now at probably 50, uh, 40 or 50 gigawatts. So it's you know way over overshot. And I think when you get the utility rate-based plants, and this is a small one, and it's one that I think Amanda lives in, and certainly the folks at Calpine and NRG as well, when you're competing against a, a utility power plant, and this is still true in, in the wholesale markets that are open, so this isn't just a Texas versus Georgia type thing, but even in the competitive markets, when you have advantage generation, that, you know, and, and some people even consider the, the production tax credit to be such an advantage, um those those things tend to make it harder to to compete and so you're more reluctant to take the risks of technological investment um it's been uh again once you get the monopoly out of the way and get them on your side and then you don't have their assets out there being favored or you know they we call that vertical integration um and you have isos that really kind of manage the the rules of the road, the referee that keeps everybody inside the field to compete fairly, those that becomes a, a, a much more welcoming open door for investors to take risks on new technology, to, to say, I'm going to try this wind turbine, I'm going to do this with solar energy, I'm going to do this with you know retrofitting my gas plants and running them more efficiently. Um, I'm going to do these new things on batteries, and so these this this environment. You know, remember the the utility industry is for good purpose uh, one of the most conservative industries in U.S. history. Um, they they don't get rewarded for taking uh, risks; they get punished for you know when things go wrong, and nobody pays any attention when things go right. So 
that that um, that's mitigated when you have a person risking their own dollar, risking their shareholder dollars to do that investment. Uh, regulators and politicians, while interested, become a little less uh, engaged in trying to tell people to do the the most conservative thing. So it is a it, it's it's a business structure, and culture matters. And so if you want to have an extremely conservative culture, you have a different type of business than if you have one that's really taking risks to move the ball forward into the new century and and really adopt new technologies. Yeah, and we think about competition is delivering um, value in terms of lower prices. But in my mind, one of the things that competition can deliver better than regulation is innovation. And, and we see that both on the wholesale side, as Pat just discussed, but also on the retail side. Um, if you look at our retail businesses, and we do participate in Illinois and Ohio and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and all of those states that have retail competition, but they have it with a default supplier model um, our products that we offer in texas which doesn't have a default supplier model are way more innovative than we're able to deliver in other states and it's for a number of reasons it's because we get access to better data in texas all of uh, the homes have smart meters on them and we get real-time um, access to that that data and information so we can structure time of use products we can structure um, you know, we have free night solar days is one of our uh, products that we offer in Texas. We have a, a product that, um, you know, targets electric vehicle owners and, and helps them to manage their costs in order to be able to uh, charge their vehicles for free. We have um, products that, that allow us in, in retrospect to go back and um, refund the highest the highest use days in in a given month to the customer so these are all things that we can do one because we have the information the data but two we have the customer relationship so we're able to explain the value of those products to the customers in states where the utility still owns the customer relationship and you're just a line item on the bill and you may or may not have access to data um, in, in many states, we don't have access to the, the real-time smart meter data. And you're competing against a subsidized default service price. You know, it really challenges our ability to be innovative to the retail customer and to offer them value other than just low price, low price for whatever kind of power that you want to deliver. And, and so that's, um, you know, I think innovation is important. It's why Texas swamped the renewable portfolio standard within, you know, a couple of years and uh, and are delivering rec values to not only to in-state consumers, but out-of-state consumers. And it, it's why battery technology has taken off. So I think you can do, um, you can drive innovation forward either by mandate or by letting people compete um, but you're going to get there faster and more efficiently through competition. Yeah, I I would, Amanda, I would completely second what you said and just add that um, to kind of ground this in, in the foundational economics, the, the distinction here between, you know, um, focusing on keeping costs low and innovation is the fundamental economic distinction between static efficiency and dynamic efficiency. And uh, good market rules get you both. And, and so, you know, if, if you kind of, I, I'll put on my, my Joseph Schumpeter hat, which is one of my favorite hats to wear, to talk about the perennial gale of creative destruction. And so you constantly have this, you know, instantiation of human creativity in figuring out, hey, are there better different ways to deliver value to people that they've not seen before? And so you have um, old existing technologies competing with new technologies at the same time. And um, you know, another really good set of, of ideas around this is the, the work of Clay Christensen, who some of you will probably know from the innovators dilemma, but in, in a lot of his academic research, he pioneered the idea of um, technology learning curves and that, that technologies kind of have a life cycle and that life cycle is an S curve. And so you have an old, you know, mature established technology that has gone through its early adopter, 
phase and gone through its acceleration phase into its kind of mature plateau phase. And, you know, that's hydro and big coal fired power. And, you know, so then you can kind of think of the history of the 20th century as these successive waves of technologies, new inventions coming in and competing with these existing ones. But, you know, we still have hydro and, and some of these it, it's because they're they're regulated and but it's also because their useful lives are so long as assets. And so they're still they're still just cranking. And and so you have now, you know, six or seven different technologies competing against each other and they're each at different parts of their life cycle so um so it's about this innovation as trying to find new ways to deliver value to customers at the least possible cost and so i think it's contextualizing what do we mean by that value which is increasingly a composite of both economics and environmental attributes yeah, Lynn, thanks for kind of adding that condition on innovation, because I think that's really important. And <laughs> I think that connects back to what Pat started talking about with like managing risk, right? And it would it would uh, it would really be, you know, a disservice for us not to recognize that, you know, putting my old consumer hat back on um, that, you know, really like the the consumers that led the, co the competition movement were really motivated by the fact that initial approaches towards innovative uh, investments decades ago actually were really just socializing risk on captive consumers. And that led to a bunch of uh, competitive, uh, you know, calls for competitive reforms, right? That really put it over the top. And interestingly enough, in parts of the country that have retained that monopoly model, we find the same type of behavior, right? We see, we see some of the, uh, the, the, the monopoly boondoggle projects in the Southeast, right? Um, where it, it's almost like deja vu from the 70s all over again. <laughs> um, whereas the, 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 the more enterprising and, and, um, and risk managed uh, uh, cultures that you see with uh, competitive power suppliers manage risk and uh, pursue innovation in a way that typically lowers costs rather than increases costs. So I think that that's a really important distinction. And, and Pat, I didn't, and Amanda, I don't know if you had any additional thoughts on sort of those um, that approach to innovation and risk management after what, what Lynn had uh, commented on. Well, I'll mention one, and I think Amanda's got some good data points from what happened last year in the freeze, but, um, you know, the the point of, you know, shifting that risk off the back of consumers that we slathered on for, you know, generation for each of those investments. I mean, that is really one of the great I would consider the great victory of the move to competitive markets is we shifted the risk from customers who have no control over it. They have regulators that are appointed or elected by governors to, to oversee this monopoly business. And those regulators look at, you know, a, a bucket of water every three years to try to ascertain what the right balance of rates and service and all that is in, our, in what's called a rate case and call that regulation. But in effect, you're, you're really, subject to what a monopoly is doing and shifting those risks and instead shifting them to companies like Amanda's who know how to manage that risk better, um, both at the wholesale and the retail level. And, uh, you know, for example, and, you know, Amanda, you can fill us in on details, but, you know, at in the winter freeze, we had tremendous increases in wholesale rates when we had a supply demand imbalance of, you know, biblical uh, magnitude. But, what happened there is that risk was borne for competitive customers. That risk was borne by companies like Amanda's and the other retailers and the other generators in the state. And that doesn't come back to be slathered on you for the next 20 years. We do have some regulated parts of Texas, the municipals and the co-ops, for example, many of whom are in fact taking those large bills from the wholesale power spikes of that week and slathering them over their customer bases for the next several years. Customers like me who are served by a competitive provider are like, you know, that was borne by my provider. Their job was to hedge and manage that risk. Some of them had a tough time doing it, but that's the construct is you manage the risk provider because you're the expert. I'm the customer. And if I don't like the way you're managing my risk, I can sh shift to somebody who can do it better. And that's kind of the American way. So when I talk about liberty, it's not this amorphous ancient Greece concept. It's a real pocketbook issue. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, thank you for raising that issue from Winterstrom Uri, Pat, because this is something that I've heard as I've gone outside of Texas and talked to regulators about retail competition. And they were like, oh, but you know, we heard that in in during Winter Storm Uri, Texas customers were exposed to electric bills that were thousands of dollars. And um, that largely comes from some reporting that was done on one retail supplier who offered a product to residential customers that was uh, tied to the wholesale price of power. But every customer who had a fixed price contract or even a variable price contract, um, they saw whatever rate they'd agreed to in their contract, right? So they paid um, eight or nine or 10 cents a kilowatt hour, not $9 a kilowatt hour um, as you know, those customers who were tied to the wholesale price of power were seeing. And so it really was, in my mind, a testament to how uh, retail competition protects consumers because that is the service that we offer is the the risk management the the hedging you know we procure power on behalf of those consumers and we have to manage um the risk of a winter storm yuri of you know e extremely cold temperatures and high loads and um the possibility that there's not enough generation to go around and, and so my company, unfortunately, did um, have some significant losses related to Winter Storm Uri, but they were not passed on to our residential customers. Yeah, I would add to that uh, two, two points regarding um, risk in, the, con and the, the, in the, the concrete context of Winter Storm Uri. Um, one is this, this idea of the, the combined idea of using uh, consumer choice at the at the retail level and financial markets, right? And that's something that um, you know is is one of the innovations that I think, um, and and in, certainly in the in the kind of academic conversations around um, ERCOT and and the changing market design in ERCOT, one of the conversations that we have in in our kind of scholarship around this has been um, the kind of ways to try to, um, as we think about ERCOT market design evolution, and I know the Texas PUC has been thinking very deeply about this, um, what are some ways to make better use of financial markets and financial innovation to enable consumers, you know, especially residential customers, to um, get the value they want and to have the, to bear the kind of price risk that they are willing to bear and capable of bearing, and to be able to lay off the rest of that risk through financial innovation on entities like retailers. And so, for example, um, and, and I just will mention this because I was a co-author on a paper that, that came out in February in Juul, um, and we modeled kind of the, the incomplete markets for risk in, in ERCOT. And one recommendation that we made was having a, um, a hedging requirement, and, uh, which is different from having a capacity mechanism. <laughs> Let me make that absolutely clear. Um, having a hedging requirement, but then also making sure to offer at the residential level some kind of um, price insurance, like a collar, a financial collar type thing, and in my mind, I think of it as like like travel insurance, right? So you you pay for your non-refundable ticket, but then you have the option to buy travel insurance on top of that. So those kind of mechanisms. Um, but the other risk that I think gets underappreciated, and this goes back to Amanda, well, actually to Todd's initial invocation of reliability as being goal one is the risk that customers still bear around outage and that, that customers bear outage risk and aren't compensated for the, the, the lost value that they experience. And so one of the things, and, and Devin, maybe you're going to, I'm jumping the gun and you're going to ask about digitization and digital technologies, but one of the benefits of more digitization and more automation can be 
uh, enabling retailers to offer products and services that can um, you know, kind of compensate customers when they do experience outages. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Lynn, that's that's great because my my final question for you all was to really talk about this, you know, this this relationship between reliability and competitive market structures. Um, that really came under renewed focus last year, of course, um, based on the Texas event. But as we've we've seen both on the distribution side and the advent of distributed or and, and digital technologies that Lynn's referring to, as well as the performance of competitive power generators compared to monopolies, you have some pretty different um, uh, reliability implications of competitive market structures. And so I'd be curious what what Pat, Amanda, and Lynn, we can come back to you on the the final round here. Um, what you see is the relationship between reliability and, and uh, competitive markets. You know, somebody asked me, well, I've been asked several times, obviously, since last February, what should we have done in the early stages to prevent what happened last year? I mean, people died. This was real. This was not just a market uh, burp. This was a significant um, crisis for us. And I look back to the we learned a lot of lessons from other power markets across the world as they were going through changes in the late 90s, in the mid to late 90s, and we learned lessons from the gas industry. But there's one important industry we didn't look at close enough, and that was the airline industry. It was it was moved from a highly regulated to a competitive market in the late 70s under with a lot of help from our retiring justice, Stephen Breyer, who I always wanted to tip my hat to because I admired him so for his role in that with Senator Kennedy. But um, that that step that they took recognized that competitive pricing was going to change routing and all that, but it was going to also put the the push on uh, on safety and on reliability. And so they put in the minimum standards on day one that we want this with regard to reliability and safety for the airline industry. And had we done something like that, again, there were a lot of things that went on and, you know, Amanda's and I and all the others down here in Texas have lived through the unpacking of all this to make sure we don't have this happen again. But one that had we had we put in some some basic winterization rules, not just for the power industry, but for the very critical related natural gas industry to make sure that our fuel supply is, is as protected as our power plants are that that vertical uh, integration, had, had we had a minimum standard there on day one, um, we probably would have had a lot less impact. Not to say it would have been zero, but it would have been a winterization requirement, which the commission has since adopted in Texas and is in the process um, of feathering to ratchet up again this year for next winter. Um, that would have been, a, that would have been, when I say, what's my regret as the guy who helped set it up, it would be not co not copying the good lessons from the airline industry. Yeah, I, I think that um, reliability standards are important. And uh, I had never heard, Pat, you talk about the connection between the airline industry and the power industry, but I think it's a good one because uh, generators are motivated financially to be reliable, but there needs to be an even a you know stronger standard of reliability that's set from the top and one of the um i think in my mind failures of the ERCOT competitive wholesale market is that there was no reliability standard now i don't think that that's necessarily what led to winners from yuri winners from yuri was a very complicated mix of failures that uh, caused that devastating outage for so many days to so many customers. Um, but saying what is the minimum amount of reliable generation that we need in any given uh, market is an important part of setting the standard for what competition is expected to deliver. And so just like we talked about um, the need to set the standard for decarbonization, if you want a market to deliver on decarbonization, you have to set the standard for reliability if you want the market to deliver on reliability. Lynn, any final thoughts on, on this before we turn over to Q&A? No? All right, well, I think that's a, a, a wonderful uh, 
you know note to end on here and then uh, I believe we have a some some audience questions that we'll be wanting to get to here in a few minutes uh, Kevin do we have any any questions here yet we do. Thank you, Devin. And thank you, of course, to all of our fantastic panelists. This is uh, Kevin Marin uh, with Our Energy Policy. So we do have a good number of questions lined up. We'll get through as many as we can in the time we have left. Uh, I've had a few questions come in on subsidies for oil and gas. Try to summarize it with a paraphrasing of a few. Uh, what are panelists' thoughts on federal subsidies for oil and gas? You know, And in that context, do situations like the current conflict in Europe warrant any sort of government involvement in competitive markets? Well, I'm kind of uh, I kind of hate subsidies of all sort, but I think they're uh, they are with us, and they're on pretty much every industry. I've seen various studies, depending on intensity of studies and what ha uh, intensity of subsidies and what have you. You know, anything that distorts a market signal between a supplier and a customer is going to make that market less efficient. And so, you know, whether that's externalities of not taxing for pollution, which gets us to the carbon tax and carbon emissions and, and emissions control issues. Or all the way down to a, a you know what I call infant industry stimulus like we had with the production and tax credit and ITC for solar. Um, they're not infants anymore, so maybe that means we don't need those subsidies anymore. I, certainly, the oil and gas industry is not an infant, and uh, there are a lot of there are just some in, intrinsic subsidy stuff built in that is really a political question. And you know when you when you involve those political questions, you lose uh, on the on the uh, you get short term benefit for certain people that are advantaged, which I call that crony capitalism, and I don't like it. But at the end of the day, it's the world we live in, and so we have to design around that, and that sometimes creates suboptimal alternatives there. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'll just add, and this is not oil and gas specific although i i completely agree but just to be uh, uh to put a really fine point on the production tax credit investment tax credit distortions as an example of how subsidies can distort market processes and market outcomes one of the challenges that uh wholesale power markets face with increasing penetration of renewables is um, periods of negative prices and periods of curtailment. And, and so this goes back to, I think, Amanda, your initial observation about market design and that the, you know, market design as done in the 1990s it is, has not necessarily adapted well to, to the kinds of uh, renewable technologies that we have now. Um, but with, with negative prices, for example, in Texas, you, know, you can have periods of really fantastic wind that drive prices negative, and some of that is the consequence of um, transmission bottlenecks. That there's just not enough that there's just not enough wires cap capacity to get the energy from where it is to where people are. But some of that is um, distortionary incentives that PTCs create because. So, you know, the, and the number um, from a few years ago was minus 34, that uh, the production tax credit was basically $34 a megawatt hour. And if you're a wind owner, since it's a production tax credit, in order to, to get the, the PTC, you have to produce. And so what does that mean? That means that you have an incentive to submit an offer price in the market as low as negative $34. And, you know, that, um, you know, for example, that puts a lot of pressure on existing nuclear baseload and puts them under a lot of financial pressure. And so, you know, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of policy arguments for subsidizing nuclear or coming up with, you know, like in Illinois, we have these zero emission credits, the ZEX, going to the, the nuclear power plants that Exelon owns. Um, and so they're basically having a subsidy created distortion that is now being addressed by another subsidy, which is going to create another distortion. And so it's, just, um, you know, better to, to get rid of all the subsidies now that the levelized cost of energy for wind and solar is as low or lower than natural gas. And I would note that the solar one is all capital credit, so it it probably results in more construction of solar than would otherwise happen without the subsidy. But 
it doesn't distort the markets in the same way that that volumetric subsidy that Lynn just walked through does. And it's it's one when people kind of lump the wind and solar subsidies together. So they work very differently. We had constraints on the ERCOT grid. It's very been a very windy month here. Um, and so the transmission constraints, which usually haven't been a big issue, have been a big issue last week because there's wind and solar trapped in West Texas that can't get to the population centers in East Texas. And so the wind pokes just keep on going. But you'll see that the solar, which was predicted to go up to, you know, say eight or nine gigs in the middle of the day, voluntarily curtails because they don't want to have to pay to put power on the grid because they'll lose money because they don't get the production tax credit for every kilowatt hour they dump. So the subsidies are 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 tough. And I, uh, again, I don't think they cause markets to fail, but they make it really tricky. As as Lynn says, they just make it messier and messier. And you know, the end, the end loser on this thing is the customer. So even though you think subsidies might help, they ultimately create a suboptimal market for all of us. Well, I think that's actually a good transition to our next question here. You each mentioned the transmission and distribution a little bit. Uh, we do have a direct question for Pat from Todd Foley. On transmission and distribution, please comment on the measures in the recently enacted bipartisan infrastructure law and FERC efforts to promote investment and development. How important well, are these efforts for system modernization and new development? Will they work and what else can be done? Yeah, I was really happy to see FERC put out that NOPR last week. They started a, a NOPR process, which is kind of largely, let's talk about everything in the kitchen sink, and then they focused on some discrete issues. There are some very, uh, I would say, delayed needs to get infrastructure set up for the market that is a decarbonized America. And so the backbone infrastructure for that, uh, which was in both the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill the president signed last year, which is starting, I think we're starting to see some initiatives now from the Department of Energy and FERC and others to go forward and implement that, are key. Transmission is hard as hell to build, and it's not going to get easier if we wait one more year because more people will live in our country and you've got more people who you know, have right away issues. It, it's a, it's the worst part of my job. 10 years, I would say it was joyful, even even devising area codes and splitting up city of Houston into four area codes from one was, was easier to do than dealing with the transmission line through West Texas, because you're hitting somebody's ranch, you're hitting somebody's home, you're hitting somebody's grandfather's cemetery. I mean, it's just, it's so personal. And Infrastructure, though, is just so important for this to happen because the resources, just like they were when we built coal and nuclear far away from cities, you know, it's windy and it's sunny generally out and it's the land is cheap to be able to produce those things usually far away. So you need a good grid to move that around at distribution. I'm saying that now as I'm putting batteries on the distribution grids, you need a distribution grid that used to be designed to be one way, which was the flowing from the big grid to your house. Now you've got people with solar panels, with solar farms, with, you know, disaggregated wind, with, you know, Ford F-150s that plug into the wall and feed back into the grid, which is, I guess, coming in the next year. Uh, you know, a lot of electric vehicles, two-way everything happening all over the grid. And so the reconductoring of that is not going to be just some little incremental expense. It's going to be significant, and we have to get ready for that. And I know the utilities... Uh, are looking forward to the rate-based opportunities, and God bless them for that incentive that we regulators put in place. But it's um, it, it's the the federal jump start is helpful, but at the end of the day, it's a local deal. And even the big cross-country transmission line, lines that we've all dreamed about since I was a kid, which I hope will happen and need to happen, uh, still have to happen step by step. And um, I, I wish I had a happier uh, response to you, Todd, on that one. But I think it's it's a lot of sleeves rolled up and a lot of hard work and a lot of pounding the pavement that has always been the, the hallmark of our industry is, is touch the customer uh, and work with the landowner and the state official that has to give you a permit. It's uh, blocking and tackling work and there's no great fix from the from above. It's 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 down in the trench where we have to win this one. So it's a generation. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, moving on to the next question here. Lynn, earlier in the discussion, you pointed to Texas as an example of the best or at least the least challenging implementation of competitive markets. 
um, kind of on the other side of that coin, you know, and this is for all everyone as well. Can you offer a case where it hasn't been that beneficial or it has been, you know, particularly challenging to implement uh, competitive markets? And what really would you identify as the key challenges? Oh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't necessarily want to pick on any particular state. I mean, we, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of folks who are, are joining us have some familiarity with what happened in California in 2000, 2001. Um, and I think that, you know, and, and Pat alluded to, to this earlier about how when, when Texas was embarking on its restructuring and, and crafting its legislative approach, you know, they went and visited Pennsylvania and California and Maryland and New Jersey and, and the UK and, and tried to learn all of the, the, the best practices from each of those places. And, um, you know, and, and one of the, one of the, the kind of things that happened from California 2000, 2001 is that we learned a lot about what not to do. And, um, you know, don't <laughs> don't put in, for example, don't put in rules that that prevent your market participants from also entering into long term contracts because you're worried that you're not going to have enough liquidity in the spot market. Um, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of lessons that we learned. I think. Um, so rather than than just alluding to what happened in California. 20 years ago and and kind of re-emphasizing my critique of the incumbent default service that's used in states other than Texas that have restructured, um, I would definitely say, you know, so for example, in, in Illinois where I'm currently sitting, we have incumbent default service and you know, there's a firm contractual three-year rolling procurement that goes on and it's it's a firm you know, you pay for the power, you take the power. And, you know, so I think one thing that, that could be done it, to move away from that incumbent default service that is a really big entry barrier is to put that default service contract procurement on uh, options contracts. Because then, you know, the, the, in Illinois, the Illinois Power Agency pays less and you know it's not you know there's not as big of an investment in having this population of residential customers who are on the default service because you know you're you're not firmly committed to buying to procuring to supply them um but you have a contract in place to supply the people who want that contract uh, so kind of transitioning away from incumbent default service the other thing i would um I would add as something that um, I'm frankly surprised we haven't seen more of in Texas, but I hope we'll see more of uh, after last year is the um, implementation of more customer facing um, digital automation technologies. Uh, and I think that, you know, a lot of people have digital thermostats now, and so it's easy to automate. Uh, and, you know, if you do something like a time of use contract, then you don't even need to send data to the thermostat. It's just, you know, you just program the hours. But if you do something that's truly dynamic, like transactive energy, where you can program your preferences for how much you're willing to pay into your thermostat and then have, you know, have that participate automatically in markets on your behalf that kind of digital automation can be really powerful. Um, so that's that's one suggestion I would make. I don't want to cut off any other thoughts on that question before we unfortunately are going to have to wrap up and uh, keep our promises to everyone to be punctual. Pat, Amanda, any last thoughts? No, you're, you guys are good. Well, Pat? Yeah, to piggyback on Lynn, just a quick thought. You know, I'm sitting there drinking a glass of water and I'm sitting there thinking we designed the water industry to be all water's drinkable. But yet I'm looking out the window and watching the irrigation go, watering the grass. And you think of all the other uses of water. We designed electric industry similar to be four nines, 
complete reliability for everybody at, you know, thinking about mostly a residential customer on life support issues. So that, that's how we design our system. Might it be a lot more exciting if we take up what Lynn just said and use the digital revolution to really allow people to have different grades of it and to, and to actually get a, get a discount for being willing to take a little bit lower grade of electricity because they have, like I have at my house, solar and storage. So it'd be nice to, if I would have been able to give my power to somebody that was dying in East Houston last February, I would have done that in a heartbeat. Uh, and so we had a system that really allowed customer choice, not just to be on price and on renewable attributes, but on the, the amount of uh, stability and reliability that you really need to pay for. So uh, that's an exciting part of the future, and I have no doubt that it will come. Now, thanks, Pat. And that's a fantastic point to end on, because all of you were so insightful on not just the pricing issue, but all of the issues, risk management, reliability, innovation, and of course, technology and how it can influence some of the decisions made uh, to be made going forward. So uh, we are very grateful to all of you, Devin, Amanda, Lynn, Pat, and of course, to Todd Snitchler for his opening remarks. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us today. I'd like to recommend to all of you to um, go to the Our Energy Policy website and use one of our programs, the Our Energy Library, to supplement this fantastic conversation. We'll have studies, reports, papers, and so forth on this topic featured on the library. And of course, use the library for any of the work that you do to support um, your research and uh, your study with respect to any of these energy issues. So um, my final thanks to all of our partners for their support of us, particularly to the Electric Power Supply Association, our co-host today. I'd like to wish all of you a great rest of the week, and thanks again for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, all of you. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you. Great. Thank you.